Hello and welcome to a revision video on paper one of AQA English Language. Either you're retaking in November or you've got a mock. I'm showing you this so you know where to find the resources that we're going to be working on. I'm going to be using the November 2018 paper. Here come the top tips. Make some notes, they're coming thick and fast. The first thing you notice is that you have one hour and 45 minutes. Believe it or not, this means there isn't a moment to spare, and you want to spend as many of those minutes as possible writing. Every minute you spend planning is a sacrifice. So planning can be essential on question five, but you want to keep it to a minimum. The examiners offer you this advice. You are advised to spend 15 minutes reading through the source. And I have to tell you that is the wrong advice. Do not spend 15 minutes reading through the source. In fact, you should only read the source relevant to the question that you're answering. There are loads of reasons for this, but no human being, including me, would be able to remember what they read in those 15 minutes. And you get no marks for reading. You only get marks for what you write. So any time spent reading and not writing gets you no marks. You want to be able to minimise the reading, get to writing as quickly as possible. Right, now we come to question one, which always has four simple marks to it. And the idea in the examiner's mind is that these are four marks that are very easy to get. On average, each student gets 3.5 marks on this question. So if two students take it, one will get four and one will get three. It's designed to give you confidence. So if you are not a confident student, it does pay to do question one first. You don't need any explanations in here. You just need the quotations that answer the question that you're asked. And you will always be asked to look at only a small section of the text. So this can be pretty quick. So in this exam paper, the question was list four things about this jungle from this part of the source. And you don't have to make up what those things are or interpret them. You're just going to quote from the passage. Let's have a quick look at it. So we only had to look at those lines, a very short section, and just pull out quotations that tell us about the jungle. Now, just a word of warning here. Many students ignore the stuff in the box that tells you the context. And don't do that. It's really useful for you to know the context where this passage appears in the actual book that it's taken from. That will be relevant in later questions, so do read it. Now, if we go to the mark scheme, you can see the examiners have got a massive list of facts that you could include, and you only needed to find four. So you can see how easy the question is intended to be. OK, we now move to question two, which gives you another section of the same extract. This is really useful because the extract is actually given to you. What does that mean? It means you don't have to read the whole of the source. So I would read just up to lines 26. You could, if you're a confident person, just start at line 16 to 26. In other words, just read this bit. Because at this stage, you won't have had to have read all of this in order to understand what the examiner is asking you to read in the extract that they give you. This is an unusually short extract, by the way. You might have a lot more stuff here before the part that they direct you to. So if you were doing a mock, I would definitely advise you going straight in on this part of the extract and not reading the rest. And it's a judgment call for you if this is the retake. It's got to be about your confidence. So you're going to do what you feel confident here. Right, there are three things that the examiners will always ask you to do with this question. These words are always the same. You've got to look at the writer's choice of words and phrases. That means you have to quote. You've got to look at language features and techniques. That means you have to say what the methods are. And then you have to write about sentence forms. Well, no, you don't, Mr. Sallis, because the examiner says you could write about sentence forms. And actually, what they've discovered is most students write rubbish when they write about sentence forms. And so now you do not have to do that third bullet point at all, ever. You never have to write about sentence forms. 
I train all my students to write about a list because you will always find a list in this extract. However, if you're doing this, however, if you're doing the November exam and you haven't got time to learn about how to write about a list, don't just forget this bullet point. So basically you quote and you explain what the method is and then you use that to answer whatever the question is. The question will always be how does the writer so you always need to write about the writer's purpose. So they're describing the Tyrannosaurus Rex in this way using a metaphor or using a simile or using personification or using alliteration in order to make us realize that, in order to suggest that. So it's actually a really simple question that's the same as English that you've done probably ever since you were in year four. You just find quotations, name the technique, and show how that makes the reader react to whatever is being described. And that, of course, is the writer's purpose. These have to be specific things. So the writer might want us to feel that characters are in danger or that Tyrannosaurus Rex is really powerful. You will never write, it interests the reader because that gets you no marks. Everything the writer does is to interest the reader. You will never write to paint a picture in our minds because everything the writer does is to paint a picture in our minds. You're always going to think about the specific purpose. So I will just do one little bit with you. It came on great oiled, resilient, striding legs. So there's my words and phrases. What is the technique? Well, there's a metaphor in there because the legs aren't literally oiled. It makes it sound like a machine. Or I've got a list of three adjectives, oiled, resilient and striding. And the purpose of that list is to suggest that the Tyrannosaurus Rex is unstoppable. Now, students always want to know, OK, well, how many of these quotations do I put down in order to get my eight marks? And the answer is as many as you can in the time that you've got. So you should know the timings. I teach my students that you have 1.5 minutes for each mark, so they have 12 minutes to answer this question, but included in that 12 minutes is the reading time of the question, okay? So answer the question, and as soon as your time limit is up, move on. The reason for that is the marks at the beginning of the question are so much easier to get than the marks at the end. And that's because of the way the mark scheme is organized. So you may have noticed that the marks are organized into four levels. At the top level, you must be perceptive and detailed. That means you have to write a lot extra to get into level four. So if you're going to overrun on a question, you're going to need a lot of time to get into the perceptive and detailed. However, if you don't overrun, you just stop that question where it is and you go to the next question to get the level one marks, simple and limited. Well, you can get all of those marks in one or two minutes. So going on to the next question and claiming all the simple and limited marks is really, really efficient compared to spending the extra time on the question you're on and really only getting one or maybe two marks maximum because you don't have time to be perceptive and detailed if you're running out of time. Now, if we go to the mark scheme of question two, you will see that the examiners are always after the same sorts of things. There's always metaphor. They haven't given us a simile in this example because this is only a part of the answer. But there's also personification, which again is a type of metaphor. And the other big two are simile and alliteration. If you look for those four, you will always be able to get the marks for sophisticated and accurate use of subject terminology. Anything else you spot is a bonus. OK, now you move to question three, which is also eight marks long, which means you also have 12 minutes, which includes your reading time. Here, you must read the whole of the source, but as you've already read the first half of questions one and two, it's not going to take you long to get the rest. Now, this is the structure question, and the question will always be exactly like this. How has the writer structured the text to interest you as a reader? The examiners don't care what you spot as a structural feature. There isn't a hidden list, unlike 
the obvious one that I gave you for question two. However, every source that you ever read is structured by the writer in a specific way. What's that, Mr. Salis? Paragraphs, says Mr. Salis. Now, the great thing about paragraphing is every time the writer uses a new paragraph, it's to emphasize something different. It's to focus on something different. So all you have to do is explain why there are these changes of paragraph. What's the point of that shift in focus? So, for example, if I'm writing about that first sentence here, the jungle was high and the jungle was broad, sounds like music and flying tents filled the sky, and those were pterodactyls soaring with huge grey wings. So that focus is to give us a sense of wonder at this prehistoric environment that our characters have been transported into. I'm going to ignore the conversation for a minute, other than to focus on this very short paragraph here. Shh, says one of the characters. This is to prepare for the entrance of the Tyrannosaurus Rex and also convey the danger that they're in if they're heard by this prehistoric monster. Then we have a big paragraph describing the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Well, what's that focus for? Obviously, it's going to be to convey the huge power and danger that this animal presents to the travellers in time. You will notice that there are loads of paragraphs. I don't have to write about all of them, just those changes of focus that seem significant. So I might pick on this line here, it sees us. Again, a really short sentence with dramatic impact because it suggests something's about to change. The animal has noticed them. Maybe somebody is going to be killed by it. So the writer is playing with our expectations. Next, I can focus on this paragraph. Why is the focus now on the Tyrannosaurus as a monster rather than a dinosaur? Well, that might convey the relief at having killed it. Then there's another change of focus here where the rifle's cracked again and we've got different sounds conveyed here. Why might the writer want to recreate the sounds of the killing? Maybe to make it more real, maybe to make it more powerful maybe to make it more poignant. You will notice that the monster now has jeweler's hands. It's been personified as a human being, which means maybe it was wrong for them to kill the monster. And then we have the final sentence, like a stone idol, like a mountain avalanche, Tyrannosaurus fell. We can say anything we like about this description as long as we talk about the change of focus. So the change of focus which compares it to a religious symbol or to a huge structure in nature, a mountain, might suggest that it was totally wrong to kill this incredible animal. Three top tips here. Number one, always write about the focus at the beginning and then always write about the focus at the end. This is because it's very easy to show the examiner that you're being perceptive if you're considering the whole text. And writing about the beginning and the end shows the examiner you've thought about the whole text. You will see that in the examiner's extract from a perfect answer, they start with the beginning. That's also a very easy exam tactic to follow because you just move through the text, picking out details as you see them, making sure you've got time to also write about the ending. When you write about the ending, you're then proving to the examiner that you have a judicious range of examples. So it's much easier to get into level four. And if we look at level three, your examples must be relevant. And that's another exam trick here. This extract that the examiners give you, because the extract that they give you will not be a standalone thing. It will have come from something else. Well, what does that mean? It means the examiners have gone through this whole short story and thought which bit will fit the exam best. When they do that, they want a piece that has a clear sense of a beginning and a clear sense of an ending. So when you write about the beginning and the ending, you're giving the examiner what they want. They want you to think about how this ending has been crafted, even though it hasn't really been crafted that way. Yeah, they've just found a piece that looks like it has a really good end. So give the examiner what they want. 
tell them about the effect, the impact of the ending. The ending, by the way, will always refer back in some way to the beginning. So if we go to the beginning of this text, we can see the emphasis on hunting animals and Eccles saying, I'm shaking like a kid. Here, that idea of hunting is taken to an extraordinary level where the animal they've killed isn't like any of the other animals at the beginning. And it's not the people who are shaking. It is the whole earth. That's why it's like a mountain avalanche. So the writer has taken that idea of shaking and instead of applying it to one individual, has applied it to the whole landscape. Now that isn't an accident. The examiners will always choose a text that with a little thought you can see has a circular structure, by which I mean there's something at the end that refers back to an idea at the beginning. There will always be some changing this, which shows the new impact that the writer is after. And when you argue that this is a new impact, you are automatically being perceptive, the examiner gets excited, and you get in the top level. Now, question four, you will notice, is worth 20 marks, which is the same as questions one, two, and three added together. So, if you're in your mocks, I would like you to consider doing question four before you answer the other questions. The reason for that is if you spend your energy on question four right at the beginning, you're fresh, you'll be able to blitz out a brilliant answer compared to how you will feel much later in the exam. About 20% of students who take this exam run out of steam by question four, and so they do a very bad answer, which costs them loads of marks because there are 20 marks available. And they might have used loads of energy on question three, which is great. But remember, question three is only worth eight marks. And they've used loads of energy on question two. But remember, question two is only worth eight marks. So if that describes your experience of the mock, then I would recommend doing question four before one, two and three. However, don't do that. If you'd much rather go through it in order, that's fine. I'm just giving you a little bit of advice based on your experience on the mock. Right, what do you need to know about question four? Well, there will always be a specific part of the text to look at. It will never be on the whole text. Now, that can be slightly annoying because, let's say in this example, lines one to 30 will probably have a lot of stuff you could use to answer your question, but you will get no marks for it because it's not in the part of the extract that you're supposed to be referring to. A really easy organisational tip is to have a highlighter or a pen and where it says line 31 to the end, go to your insert, find the right spot and just do a line next to it. Line 31, I'm drawing a line all the way down to the end and now I know it's only that section that's going to feature in my answer. You will always get an invented statement that says, you know, somebody said. So here a student said, this part of the story where the man encounters the Tyrannosaurus Rex shows Eccles is right to panic. The monster is terrifying. Now, then you'll be asked, to what extent do you agree? The examiner doesn't care whether you agree or not. In the report on the exams, the senior examiner always says this. You can get full marks in three ways. You can totally agree. You can totally disagree or you can partially agree or partially disagree. Well, if we go to the mark scheme, we'll see that the examiner has looked at this idea, Eccles is right to panic, and began their answer by saying, well, actually, no, I don't think Eccles is panicking at the start at all. So there's partial disagreement. And as they get longer into their answer, they then write about Eccles' sense of panic. So the pattern I have noticed in all the exams that have been published so far is that the examiner's answer is never completely agree or never completely disagree. So if you have one area where you slightly disagree, it's super useful because that's a way to show that you're being perceptive and that you're evaluating. You're saying, yes, on the whole, I agree, but for this little bit, which is slightly different. That's evaluation you do that, it's really easy to convince the examiner that you're being convincing. 
and perceptive, and it's much easier to get into level 4. In this example, even at level 3, the examiner's answer says, I don't think his reaction is panic at this stage, but then, Eccles then starts to fear for his life, so the rest is about the panic. Well, why does the examiner do that? Because this word evaluation is still there. And it's just so much easier to show you're evaluating if you don't fully agree or disagree. Now, this is a really easy question because what you're going to do is just write as much as you can in your time limit. You have 30 minutes to do this question. And so you can write a hell of a lot in 30 minutes. Let's see how many pages they give you. One, two, three, four, four pages. So that you've got lots of room to blitz your answer out. And it's just a point scoring system. Everything you notice that's relevant to the question that you write about gets you marks. Really, this is very much like question two. So if we look at the second bullet point, evaluate how the writer describes the monster. That's where your methods come in, the techniques that the writer is using, which again will be lists, which again will be those classic things the metaphor, personification, simile, and alliteration and sibilance. You know, it's nearly always the same stuff. You can notice anything else. They're all bonus. And students typically do reasonably well on this question because the question itself is not difficult. It's the answer showing that you're evaluating where the difficulty lies and also in the number of pages you possibly need to fill to get into the top band. And that's another reason why I recommend that you do question four before questions one, two, and three, unless that fills you with fear, in which case, do it your way. Okay, we now come to question five, which, as you know, is about 45 minutes long. Now, you may have been trained to plan your answer in detail, Different schools use different methods, but the key thing here is you get zero marks for your plan. No marks at all. So five minutes max. The quickest way to plan, of course, is just to annotate the picture for stuff that you want to write about. Most schools train their students to do the description question rather than the story question, which is fine. They both have exactly the same mark scheme. You will notice that in this year, the description question was not about the picture. The examiners could easily do that again. But if we look at the description question, describe life as you imagine it in 200 years time, you could actually use that picture as a way to... You could actually use this picture as part of your description if you want to. Now, if you're in the exam and you don't know whether to do the story or the picture, there is a really quick way to decide. When you read the story task, write a story about time travel as suggested by this picture. If you can't think of a really good ending for a story, the chances are you're going to write something that's not very good. So if an ending doesn't appear to you in the first 30 seconds of thinking about it, you are not going to do the story question. You are going to do the description question. Now, there are a number of ways that you can prepare for this question in advance. So let's imagine you're doing the description question. You know that there are going to be characters in your description question and there are going to be settings. Well, you can prepare both of those in advance. You can't predict what the actual setting is. So you won't know that, oh, I'm going to get a picture of a station in advance. But you will know that there will be weather, either good or bad. So you can prepare two weather descriptions in advance, one positive and one negative. Similarly, you know there will be characters, and you might want to prepare a positive character and a negative character. It would be really easy to apply that here. So if we look at this question, describe life as we imagine it in 200 years' time, well, we could obviously write about climate change and put our weather descriptions in there. We could take our negative or our positive character and have them picture life from their point of view in 200 years' time be really easy to put those in. Now the advantage of that is that could be 300 words of writing that you've already prepared in advance and so that's most of your writing for the whole question 
and you've already prepared it, you know what you're going to write going in. That's super useful for the 24 marks available for the content and organisation of your writing. But how much time have you spent thinking about these 16 marks for technical accuracy? You probably thought, well, I'll get what I get. You know, my spelling isn't very good. My punctuation might not be very good. I'll just get the marks that I get. I can't really do anything about that now. Not so. Come with me to the mark scheme. So let's imagine we're in the top level here, but we're not a top level writer, okay? You're not going to get grade 8 and 9 for your punctuation. However, if we ignore those first two bullet points, which talk about consistency and high levels of accuracy, look at this. Uses a full range of appropriate sentence forms for effect. Well, if in your pre-prepared description of a character or the weather, you've already written sentences which have colons and semicolons in them, that will give you a range of sentence forms and it will give you some really interesting use of vocabulary. So you will get this part, a wide range of punctuation used, even if later on you make mistakes and you don't have a high level of accuracy, you'll still sneak into this level. Then we come down to this bullet point here, extensive and ambitious use of vocabulary. Well, you might not do that all the way through your answer, but you can make sure that this brilliant vocabulary is in these pre-planned descriptions. Now, what that means is when you make your spelling mistakes and when you might not use ambitious vocabulary later on, or you might not use it properly, you won't lose as many marks. So instead of getting a level two, for example, you're going to end up with a level three because you have features of level four writing in your answer. So if you do nothing else before now in the exam, go away and write some of those pre-prepared descriptions or find stuff that you've written in the past that's already good and memorize bits of it. Or if you type these magic words into YouTube, how to cheat the description question, Mr. Sales, you will get lots of descriptions that you can use in this way. Let's now look at the mark scheme. To get the top marks, you need to be convincing and compelling what does the examiner mean by that? Well, they want lots of different paragraphs, so make sure you do that. They want convincing and complex ideas. Well, the easiest way to do that is through contrast. That's why I asked you to prepare negative and positive characters. They'll be a contrast. And negative and positive weather. They'll be a contrast. They want an inventive use of structural features. Well, the easiest one to do there is where you look at the same scene through different perspectives or from different times. And then the other one that's not quite as easy is to give it that circular structure. Remember from question three that that just means having something at the end of your writing which refers back to something that was in the beginning of your writing. So if I type Mr. Sales how to cheat the description question into YouTube, let's see what I get. One, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine videos that will help you with this question. I do have more than that, of course. I've got lots of videos on every single question and you can just search within YouTube. Make sure you put Mr. Sally's first and then the question number and you will get a whole range of videos that will help you smash the exam. So relax, don't panic, prepare your description question, work out the order in which you're going to do the exam papers, and see you soon on my channel.